Welcome back to a, uh, another segment of uh, Poets in Montana. And uh, today's guest, uh, after, after thinking about what I just said, it kind of re reminds me of something that uh, my, my grandmother used to say, which is, uh, you can take the poet out of Montana, but you can't take the Montana out of the poet. Today's, here, here. Here, here. <laughs> today's guest is Roger Dunsmore, uh, our old friend. Anybody who's been in Montana in the last 50 years and knows anything about poetry knows Roger. And uh, Roger has too many, as I was just talking to him before we started, too many things to even go into. He's done so goddamn much in, the, in the, just his lifetime in Montana, which has been 50 plus years. So uh, uh, anyway, welcome, Roger. Uh, yeah. How you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> just coming off COVID uh, Omicron or something, and uh, which kicked my ass. Ooh. Uh, but uh, it wasn't. It wasn't one of those. Oh, you'll just feel like a bad cold. It wasn't one of those. It was a real ass kicker. But uh, uh, feel that's two weeks today. I came down with it, so I'm feeling back uh, among the living. Yeah, yeah. You're not as tired as you were. Or no no not not as tired etc i mean i heard i saw that you know part of that uh, long covid stuff has to do with fatigue and yeah kinds of things but yep 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 well, that's so, great to hear man yeah oh my god you're a trooper because you're not a spring chicken at this point well no sort of a fall chicken <laughs> not a not a rooster though <laughs> funny how that happens <laughs> yeah no kidding You'll learn more about that as you oh, go. Oh, God knows. I'm already a learning. <laughs> the learning curve is steep. Yeah, it gets steeper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, anyway, uh, Roger and I have known each other for a long time now. But, you know, I mean, I guess uh, about 25 years or so, yeah. maybe a little bit longer. Because I remember, yeah. I remember meeting you the first time that I actually met you, I think, uh, was at the uh, uh, the Garden City Reading. Yep, that's right. That that wasn't you, that Holbrook. Holbrook hosted that thing, didn't he, for years? John Holbrook, yeah. And then and uh, and and John Holbrook will be my next guest. Cool. On this program. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so John and you were there and. Uh, and uh, Pat Todd was involved. Yeah. And and Dave Thomas. And Ed. Ed and Ed Leahy was there exactly. Oh, God. Which uh, which of course is kind of how we became friends, because uh, I met you when I went down to grad school and kind of got to know you there uh, at the university where you were working in and out of the English department or, you know, that. that Humanities. I, 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 was, right. I was in English in 63 to 66, and then I came back in humanities full time. Right. And, and uh, you know, we got to visiting uh, over the idea of poetry because you were obviously a poet. I see that uh, your first book, uh, uh, On the Road to Sleeping Child, Hot Springs, was published in 72. Yeah. That was the year I graduated from high school 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, we got to talking and, and, uh, and I mentioned, we got to talking about that reading where Ed was at and you were at, uh, in, I think that was like 95. Yeah, probably. I mentioned wanting to meet Ed and, and you're the one that kind of, uh, introduced me to him, which I, I'll be forever uh, indebted to you on that. Well, I didn't know that. You know, Ed and I went back to the early 60s, and, and we'd known each other and liked each other all along, but we didn't get super close until I came back from China in uh, 91, and I had nearly died over there and was in terrible shape, and Ed was locked up in the, in the uh, psych unit uh, in the little hospital up near the interstate. And uh, I think Dexter Roberts told me, go up and see Ed. So I, I went up to see Ed and I felt so out of sorts and having so much uh, uh, trouble re-entering American culture. I'd been out for 
six months and uh, as I said, nearly died and, and, and had fallen in love and all kind of shit. And uh, I felt at home up in the psych ward. It was the only place I really felt comfortable when I got back. So I grew up and see Ed all the time up there and sit around and BS with him. And out of that, uh, 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 me feeling uh, not in good shape and him obviously not in good shape, but out of that, we bonded at a much deeper level. Yeah. And and uh, that lasted until he died, you know. Yeah. So it was, uh, how, it, was really a, it was really a boon to me because my self-confidence as a writer was always uh, uh, troublesome. I didn't have the confidence I needed. And he he in those years from 95 to in the early 2000s really helped me uh, just gain some confidence and step into my uh, identity as a poet more and deeper and better and all that jazz. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I can kind of relate to your your own sort of feelings uh, uh, along those lines. It's hard to to try to uh, embrace that or, or like you say, step up to that. I mean, yeah. with, you know, wh whatever that designation is, you know. Yeah. In the end, you and I both know that we're all poets. Yeah. But some of us don't write things down. And, yeah. Uh, and and the more you write down, I think maybe the better you get at it, uh, and of being whoever you are. And that's all you can ever do as a poet, right? Yeah. 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 It, it be who you are and do what you can do. And yeah. But the acknowledgement of it was always difficult for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, that I was that capable of that or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we had this image, this idealized image of T.S. Eliot saying, well, I can understand why you would uh, say that you wrote poetry, but why would you ever call yourself a poet? <laughs> <laughs> and there's some truth to that. I mean, it's yeah. it's what you do, finally. It's, I mean, it's sort of like I pound nails, only it's words. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, and after a while, you just kind of get used to it after you've accepted that <laughs> burden. <laughs> I can't help myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What the hell else am I going to do with myself? Exactly. <laughs> so I tell you what, I mean, uh, since you mentioned that, uh, do you have that poem uh, you sent me uh, at hand? The I absolutely do. The poem? Yeah. I mean, because that I, this was a, a fairly recent well, I'll let you tell the story, but I mean, I, I read that poem and I thought it was just terrific. It's so captured. Well, I won't say anything. I'll let you read the poem. Now, now, did you read the slight edit I did of it as well as the original? Uh, probably. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know where you're at. So go ahead and read it. Yeah. Well, let me say a couple words about it uh, first. Yeah. It's called Whale. It was written in the Orkney Islands uh, in 67. At that point, I had only been writing uh, a year, one year. I had never taken a writing class of any kind or had a writing teacher of any kind and didn't know what a poem was or if I was capable of such. And, uh, but I wrote this poem, Whale, and, and kind of forgot about it and then tried to uh, found it again and tried to do some more versions of it later. Could never get it right, but last week, after, uh, since 1967, I, I only had one contact with this guy, uh, Clive Strutt, the guy I wrote the poem for, emailed me and said, he said he'd been going through his diaries and he found this poem I wrote for him back in 67 when we were both up in the Orkney Islands together on an, a damn near abandoned island for a week, hanging out, having a good time. And he wanted to publish this poem. Was I okay with that? So I said, sure, but send me a copy. I want to see what I was capable of when I didn't know what a poem even was. And uh, so then he sent me, in fact, I'll hold it up. This is from, this is from Clive's uh, uh, diary, the, ori the original, untyped, of course. And then I, and I thought, when I first got it, I thought, I don't want, I don't want to touch it. <laughs> I, I like it. I didn't know what I was doing. I don't want to touch it. And then after a couple of days, I thought, well, I'll just touch it a little bit. 
terrible, terribly dangerous moment. But I did. But and I think I I think the little bit works. And here it goes. It's called uh, Whale for Clive Strutt. Ripe, dead ripe, bloated on boulders, great dim eye half closed, now socket bursted, whole and ragged on a cheek, mouth clogged, tongue and hairy string teeth, blood leaks from blow hole, fluid from anus, immense bruised patches on his grooved belly, Seabirds rummage flesh, rip off strips of meat. The seabirds will wear him down in no time at all. You'll see, says local elder Isaac, pile of unkempt wrinkles and white hair, who's come to cut strands of baleen from its mouth. Oil melts into calm pools, flows to the sea, Rocks there are black suns shining. Giant penis protrudes. Tug, won't budge, dead ripe. Patch of sand, mossy rocks, seabird dung. Sit in the last sun over Rora head. Gulls sweep red stone cliffs, flick light from their bellies down to me in the dark. Whoosh, large, fast by my head, turn, follow the brown body, white striped wings up and around his arc, straight down into my face, gliding silent feet back, hooked black beak. Whoosh, veers off at the last instant, swoop up and around, jump aside, flap jacket, move off from the rocks. Homeward, wild flax spills in wind streams, small sacks of glowing silver, great wheel of chuckling, scolding gulls, cries fade to the sound of barking seals, puppy-like whines. Bell heather blooms and I can smell your stew a quarter mile away. Pearl barley, beef, beer, carrots, dumplings, spuds, onions, every spice on the shelf. A handful of tumble down crofts, sod roofs, mostly derelict now. Yours has a grindstone against the front wall, wooden barrel, orange net, flies swarm in the moss. White horses crash beach boulders. Scavenge for wood in the oily stench. Silver arcs of sea trout leap at the burn mouth, hovering, diving birds, tracks in the sand. Some have webbed feet, some have claws. Last night, walk roar ahead cliffs toward litter glutted beach, pry rocks off and over with pole sticks. Karoom! Caronum in the sea. Fire, witches on midsummer's night, burn every stick on the beach, pile huge as a house. Dwarfs are fish box windbreak, flames too hot, crouch behind windbreak. Above us, sparks and stars dance with bird silhouettes, noiseless except the sea. The fire crackles. Impossible to strip the whole beach in one night. Slog home in a squall in the morning, smell of wood smoked sausages and old fish bones. Metal floats dribble rust down your walls. Whale oil drips into flax, into gulls, swoops into sea trout, flicks skua wings, leaps in your face your eyes, your blood. <sighs> Addendum number one. More whaling ship sea captains hailed from Rackwick Bay, that's where we were, in the 19th century than from any other place in Great Britain. Number two. 
was Roman state folklorist claims that Orkney Islanders made up a significant number of members within one band of Red River Métis buffalo hunters on the North American plains in the 18th and 19th centuries. Hooray for those Orkneys. <laughs> so that's it. Were those, uh, were the addendums a, a part of the original poem? No, no, they're part of what I, I added on. Okay. And, and I thought I've gotten a little more, I was gonna say courageous, but that's too strong a word. But I've gotten a little more like, yeah, the hell with it. I mean, if I want to put an addendum on the end of a poem, I'm going to do it. You know, I, I yeah, I, whatever. You're, you're, you're in charge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I, it, it, the, the, the thing that's most striking, uh, in a way to me is that, uh, you hadn't had any, you hadn't had any training at all necessarily at that point. Uh, None. As a poet, were you reading? Uh, who were you reading? Were you reading the likes of Snyder at that point? I was reading Snyder. Snyder was a great uh, teacher, master, friend, liberator, and still is. In fact, I wrote him yesterday. <laughs> uh, still is for me. Uh, and uh, so I was reading him, but it was early stuff. It was like Earth Household, that collection of diaries and journals and stuff and work, work poems, which I love his early work poems uh, in the woods and on the tankers and stuff are great. Um, I, I had started also reading a little E.E. E. Cummings. Cummings was a poet that was accessible to me as a total uh, uh, beginner. Right. And some frost, you yeah. know, so um, if I wasn't into anything, I, I, you know, like the English poets, and the older poets in the tradition, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't get past the language barriers. Um, and, and the tone was a little high tone for me. You know, which is why I love Snyder's, uh, there's such a, and Snyder had great poems that were just part of like journal entries. One uh, is, uh, uh, I think I can paraphrase it from memory. They're working on our trail crew. He, he names the drainage they're in. They're cutting a huge fallen cedar off the trail. And Kim, a new guy on the crew, uh, gets under the cedar they're cutting. And the boss, I've forgotten that guy's name, says, get your goddamn ass out of there. Do you want to get fucking killed? Yeah. And, uh, and then the next line is just that night back at the shelter, make an extra big pot of chocolate pudding make Kim feel better <laughs> and I just and he doesn't set it up as a poem it's just a journal entry I, I think for me that kind of, of, of unpretentious uh, unself-conscious poem and I set it up in my mind as a poem yeah. uh, he has stuff like that in his early work that I, I just love it I mean that to me uh, whatever he got into with Buddhist compassion eventually there it is yeah big pot of chocolate pudding make him feel better yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so anyway a lot of snyder, snyder was just uh I, I i don't think i would ha have been able to write uh do what i did as a writer over the last uh, 50 60 years without him there as a a teacher and a model and a, a friend and an encourager. He taught with us in the Round River program in 1971. He did a several weeks uh, taking kids into the mountains and stuff with us, which was uh, just a great gift. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, because uh, I, uh, I, I was just trying to, you, you're just, uh, the poem is so close to, so close to the to nature and to that you know i say nature but i not with a small n uh you, you know animals and shit and seaweed and you know i mean just the basic yeah. stuff of wow. to walk through the world yeah Man. yeah i love that old guy cutting the cut some of the baleen out of that whale's mouth and take it home 
<laughs> right, right. And, and, uh, and, and the voice, you know, the bringing the voice in and the vernacular, uh, yeah. that, you know, that's like, uh, it reminds me too of the, the, the one that, uh, uh, the hay for the horses poem yeah. Snyder's, yeah. you know, and, uh, yeah. you know, all those guys, at least I do. And sure. What comes out of their mouth. Yeah. Yep. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, you you want to uh, just peel off another one and 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 get yeah. the two on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I this just came to me this morning while I was thinking about this reading and and uh, and thought you know I well uh, to preface it a little bit the decade of the nineties for me was one thing China. Mm -hmm. I mean, I went twice for six months. I nearly died there. Uh, in between trips, I, I took a whole year of Chinese language study to try to get a hold of the language, which I never did get a hold of very well, but at least I was there five days a week for a school year. Mm -hmm. um, and um, took Jenny back with me the second uh, trip in, uh, late in the 90s. And uh, uh, the, and the way I got to China was kind of interesting to me. Anyway, I was teaching, I was training teachers, oh God, on the Navajo reservation in the late 80s. And that was an accident. Some guy that was supposed to do that, who was an Indian for crying out loud, I was just a white boy. Um, well, he had backed out of that job. It was a humanities council, Arizona humanities council job that they funded. And, and uh, the, the Indian guy had backed out. And so they were calling around, trying to find somebody who was trained in the humanities and, and also uh, familiar with uh, Native American people and issues and stuff. And they called, I think, Margaret Kingsland at the Humanities Council here. And she said, well, you're describing Roger Dunsmore. And I had just retired. And I wasn't looking for work at all. I, I, I was uh, 50 years old. I had taken early retirement. And so they called me up and I said, well, let me think about it. I've, I've just retired. I'm not looking for anything. But I took this job and loved it. It was, it was terrific. Um, and uh, at the end of that year, be 89, June 4th, the Chinese ran the tanks over their students in Tiananmen Square. And I was out on the Navajo Reservation and I was driving into Flagstaff every day to uh, catch up uh, with what was happening in there. That was pretty exciting. I was very moved by the Tiananmen Square massacre. Right. And, uh, uh, and then that year ended and I came back to Montana and, and, and was trying to uh, f uh, dry out from that year in, uh, in, tu uh, in uh, Tuba City on the Navajo Rest. And by God, uh, within about six months, the dean called me and said, uh, well, uh, we're going to lose our exchange program with the Chinese university because everybody's so freaked out about Tiananmen Square. They're either protesting it or they're afraid. So nobody will go. Will you go for us? <laughs> and I, I thought, Jesus, I'd love to go. Yeah. But I also thought my friends on the left will criticize me for not the taking part in the protest for this and so i hesitated and it took me about two weeks and i finally i had some i had a sign which was a a, a two china blue peacocks roosting on the roof of a ranch house uh, near us to get warm uh, around the chimney and i thought by god there's those chinese i'm going to china and i could tell it and and then i had my great uncle byron died of yellow fever up the Yangtze River in 1902 during the Boxer Rebellion. I thought, I'll go up and find old Uncle Byron's ghost up the Yangtze River, you know. So I called the dean back up, hell yes, let's go to China. You yeah. know, went by myself. And uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, it, it took over my life. Uh, for uh, 91 and then back again in 97. I actually tried to go back in 93, uh, uh, partly because I was uh, still enamored of this woman there. And uh, then my, my dad had a huge stroke 
and my youngest son was uh, uh, fairly violent and, 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 and heavily and shooting cocaine in Spokane. And, and I realized I can't go. I, I've got the, the, these two people, my father and my youngest son, uh, I, I need to be here. And my ex-wife said, yeah, you, he needs to live with you. I can't handle him anymore. So I, I, I had my gig back in China, but I canceled it and everybody understood. Well, anyway, uh, sorry to go on there, but you can tell I still have a, a place for it. Uh, uh, China in me, a big place for it. <laughs> I have a lot of story there, yeah. Oh, Christ. I have a whole volume of China poems called Tiger Hill. Exactly. And, uh, but uh, going in and out of China, we, uh, we, we would go through customs in Japan because the Chinese, I don't know what the arrangement was or why they did that, but we'd land in Japan and go through customs and go on. And so I'm going to read a Japanese uh, 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 rooted poem, but uh, uh, it's connected to that whole China time and that whole China world. Um, and it's connected to poetry. And this is kind of a statement about language and poetry. It's called Kotodama. And that means in translation, the spiritual interior of words. And I thought those goddamn Japanese, they, they have the neatest ideas. Who'd have thought of having a, a descriptive phrase for the spiritual interior of words? And what we know is, is that Latin has done that within the Roman Catholic Church for a couple of thousand years. Right. Sanskrit's done it in, in Buddhism and what we call Hinduism and stuff in the continent of India and in the East for a long time. So that it's not such an unfamiliar concept, but we don't have a word. Well, this is Kododama. Oh, and the other thing about this... <laughs> The first time I learned about the Japanese internment camps in this country during World War II was about 1964. I was teaching English comp in Missoula at the university. I had a, a kid that looked, I couldn't tell what kind of uh, Far Eastern he was, but he had the classic, maybe what you would call stereotypical Oriental uh, style of face and stuff. And he wrote me a paper, a freshman comp paper, about uh, being born and growing up in an internment camp. And I'd never heard of them. And I had, and, and nobody that I knew knew of them or talked about them ever. And we were all very interested in World War II. The Japanese internment camps were, were buried. And I thought he'd made it up. And so I called him in. And he said, no, hell no. He said, I, they were, you know, they were all over the West. We moved all the Japanese. Fort Missoula. <laughs> Fort Missoula, uh, it's in December of 41. The, the, uh, the first month of the war hadn't even started. They were unloading Japanese prisoners in Missoula, Fort Missoula. Yeah. So uh, I, I, it blew me away to realize, like now the internment camps are, you know, everybody knows about them pretty much but boy back then it was a secret so anyway uh, uh, this one is set in a, the internment camp uh, in wyoming kodama the spiritual interior of words found at the site of the japanese internment camp near heart mountain wyoming a 50 gallon drum filled with marble-sized pebbles, each pebble inscribed with a Japanese written character. Seed, flower, sky, goodness, youth, dead. Each stone a memory of one who died in this camp, each to keep these dead company in a steel barrel in a ditch. Small round stones are carefully gathered from the stream beds and prairie and kept away from the eyes of the guards. Each stone a mouth 
to speak, to kiss, or throat to sing, each stone to pray, each prayer a seed to flower to sky. That's as close as I'll probably ever come to a, a pose ar ar arica. What do you call that? Poetica. Poetic ars poetica. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I that's sort of my thought. I wanted to open the reading actually tonight yeah. with uh, the spiritual interior of words from this. Uh, interior interior of words. Yeah, that's a hell of a concept, isn't it? I got it from Barry Lopez. I, I, I was reading a, a Lopez article and he mentioned it in passing in this article and it blew me away. And I immediately thought of this thing I knew of, and from the internment camp. And so, yeah, leave it to the Japanese to uh, understand things this way. They're very, very intuitive and, and wonderful in that way. Right. Yeah. So. Well, um yeah, I, I uh, uh, your 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 poetry, of course, is a reflection of your life and all your personal experience, uh, and, and it it you know uh, it covers a wide range of things, but uh, it also sort of I mean it's like it's like we to, to me I mean I think of myself too. I, I, I say I write the same damn poem over and over again, but that's probably not true. It is to, to an extent, it's true, but I, I do it in about four or five or six different ways, it seems like, focusing yeah. on different areas and whatnot that have had import for whatever reason in my own experience. And I, I recognize that pattern in your work too, you know, I mean, uh, uh, based on your... Uh, your experiences as a, as a, as a teacher, as a, yeah. as a student, as a, 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 someone who is filled with a tremendous amount of knowledge and, uh, and research and whatnot. And then, and then the more uh, contact, closer contact to, to the earth, like the, like the whale poem where, where it all began and you forgot to even have written it. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, and then the people you're always, there's always people speaking, coming in and out of, of your work and and there's this strong strong attachment to the native american uh people uh yeah. and, and so any and, and when we're kind of working class and the dirty shit i mean dirty shit keeps coming up all the time in your poems you know i don't mean by i don't mean dirty like as in <coughs> incestuous or something like that yeah, but yeah, yeah. just physically dirty yeah 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 now i owe that to snyder you know those uh, oil tanker poems and the working in the woods poems and right yeah yeah well any any uh uh anything else you want to uh pop on to next or yeah 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 i uh, one of the things i, I that, that i've been thinking about this week get i'm getting i've been trying to get ready for this reading and I hope we're not talking too much because we've only read a couple poems. But... That's, that's, why, that's why I'm trying to, you know, all of a sudden shut my mouth and just keep prodding you to read us a few more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the deal is that another thing that happened to me uh, around the, the uh, sort of uh, what, be after the China decade was Dillon, Montana. I did my last eight years of teaching in Dillon. And right. that was just a, 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 a tremendous gift to me. I loved it. I'd retired. I was bored. I didn't know what, what, what the hell. I was just a houseboy for Jenny, running errands and doing dishes and shit. And I, I, uh, I, I, I decided I wanted to uh, give her the benefit of the, uh, uh, in the retirement program, there's a spousal survivor's benefit. And I didn't know about that when I retired. Well, I called him up and I said, gee, I'd like to attach that. So my spouse, once I die, you know, my spouse will have that benefit. Okay. But in order to get that, you've got to come back into teaching now after you've been retired two years, full time for one year. And then you can apply for it. Okay. Well, I, so I, I applied to every goddamn institution in the state nobody would take me for a year not even my own institution where i had taught for 40 years they had enough of you <laughs> yeah yeah they couldn't 
they couldn't make any room for me. And then in uh, late in this, the game, uh, July, August, a guy in Dillon in the English department got promoted upstairs to administration. And they, were, and they knew I was looking, so they got back to me and said, yeah, we got something just opened up. I said, well, sign me up, you know. And the thing about Dylan, there's a couple of things about Dylan. Uh, one is the students there are like small town, rural. They're very different. They're, there's a kind of innocence to them. Uh, they're, they're not sophisticated, but they are, they've got a tremendous work ethic and they're very open, uh, willing to work. I loved them. I, it was a whole different kind of student for, for me, and I loved that. Right. Um, and the other thing was the whole curriculum was on the block system, and that means they took only one course at a time. They took it for only 18 days, and it was three hours a day, five days a week, 18 days. Boom. You get your grade, move on to the next course. Well, I loved that teaching in that block system. I go in there and God, you know, if we got tired, we'd do yoga <laughs> or, or uh, we'd sing or we'd go outdoors. And I mean, you know, and, and but, it was, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, I had room to move. We all had room to move around and, it, and, and they were such uh, wonderful uh, uh, kids. And, uh, and I tell them, you know, I, I, the department down there gave me all the comp courses. And nobody wanted to teach them. And I'd say to them kids, this is Dunsmore 101 and we can do any goddamn thing we want. This is, I've retired three times already. What the hell? Let's go. Yeah, uh, you know, and not, not to, to pull this, push this any further into this dialogue that we're in, but it reminds me of. It took me, I was like a senior, try, I was trying to get a degree and trying to get out because I had just gone and quit and gone and quit and screwed yeah. around and I'd never taken comp, I'd never taken English yeah. comp, right? And I had to take it before I graduated and I wound up taking it from Mike Kreisberg. Oh my God. And, and basically the texts were like, you know, uh, uh, Marx's manifesto. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah. You know, Mao's little red book and yeah. all this political sort of communist anarchist kind of stuff. Yeah. But but folk his main focus being on this idea of work and yeah. and that and 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 working people and common people with within your uh your own yep. experience and yep. wow, I I just had a ball. In yeah. The, us but but anyway i don't want to go down this rabbit hole any further read us the goddamn poem from dylan okay i'm actually going to read more than one by the way michael was one of my very best friends uh, in missoula all through those years we built a house together from yeah. scratch up on tv mountain <laughs> <laughs> right okay first dylan poem it's uh called uh, speaking of ivory and uh, find it here. Just, I got the page number. I just got to get to the page. Yeah, we got it. It's going to be hard to not talk to goddamn much. Well, as I as I told uh, uh, David David Cates, as I did the last one of these with, and I think David read two poems in the whole damn hour. I yeah, mean, that, that that's what that's what we have going on here. Is 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 not only just it's a conversation, but it's also your work, and so all that means, as I told David, is we're going to have to do another one of these. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, the the biggest sport in Dillon is the rodeo team, you know, and that pulls in like Blackfeet and Crows and a lot of guys you wouldn't see, you know, in Missoula. In fact, I'll read you a rodeo poem, then. but this is called Speaking of Ivory. One of the rodeo students gets thrown off a horse and have her. The horse steps on his face, breaks bones across the bridge of his nose, a purple hoof print bruised into his cheeks, head swolled up like a pumpkin. Some people think I'm crazy, but by God, come next Saturday, I'm riding a bronc to get my confidence back. 
and damned if he doesn't take second place. Speaking of bones, our neighbor, the paleontologist, and pretty sick now, esophageal cancer, says they found a woolly mammoth in a gravel pit right here back in the 20s, kept its bones in their bunkhouse, says all the ivory in Europe came from Siberia, a hundred thousand extinct mammoths dug up for their tusks, stories of peasants hacking ice age steaks off woolly mammoths emerging from glaciers. They were that hungry. Speaking of ivory, this on a marble slab inside a fenced off area at the center of the rodeo grounds. Pit, last of the John Robinson herd of military elephants, 102 years old, killed by lightning on this very spot while performing for the circus. August 6th, 1943, may God bless her. August 6th, 1943, two years to the day before Hiroshima. I look up and around checking for B-29s, storm clouds, or other signs of mushroom enlightenment. Wonder where they buried all that broiled meat and charred elephant dung. Wonder if that mammoth woolly bone spirit called the old pit out here, called in that lightning too. Topsy, the favorite at Coney Island, killed a man after he fed her a lit cigarette. So they decided to execute the elephant, not the man. The vet fed her raw carrots laced with cyanide. She wolfed them right down, didn't bat an eye. Try the latest technology, electricity, next. Mr. Edison's men wired her up right where she stood. She raised her trunk as if to speak, then began to smoke and sizzle. They preserved it on film. Electrocuting an elephant was a hit at the movies. Her organs were donated to the Princeton University, her feet made into umbrella stands. Mr. Edison's inventions were widely applauded, although his design for an electric chair took second place in the competition. May God bless the state bronc rider with a swolled up head. May God bless Hiroshima Pitt. May God bless our neighbor's cancerous esophagus and God bless Topsy too. <laughs> so that's Dylan, man. There's a journey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, the fun of a poem, right? Oh yeah, I, 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 that's fun to read a poem. I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read like about four in a row right here. Sounds uh, good. From Dylan. This is called Sitting in Jim Orr's Garden, and Jim Orr was our neighbor. He was the paleontologist who died of esophageal cancer. And his uh, great-grandfather drove the first cattle herd into Montana in the 1860s to feed the miners up in Butte. Yeah. And, uh, and he donated the land that the, that the uh, normal college where, where I was teaching rests on down there in, in Butte. So he's a, he brought the, he, he found it in a sense, Dylan. Yeah, the oars. The oars, yeah, big deal. And and he made some more money, but he drove a second cattle herd all the way from Dylan to Calgary in the 1870s and made a lot of money because there was a railhead up there. And he realized, man, talk about the open country. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. Sitting in Jim Moore's garden, you sit evenings on this bench, your constant cigarette, watching the stream flow. You created this garden on city land, all gone to Russian thistle. You set Shoshone grindstones for a footpath. 
Toward evening, your poppies begin to close. That hunk of rose quartz you hauled out of the ruby mountains, silent as a bone. Your great grandfather drove the first cattle into Montana, 1863. In your youth, all rodeos were obligatory or they'd think you were a communist. You knew deep layers of history here, cradled a black rhinoceros skeleton out of the foothills and found that meteor strike 40 miles across a hundred million years ago. Today I go to the feed store to buy black thistle seed for the goldfinches that still come to your bird feeder and remember you. Blind half the time, barely able to swallow, sitting in your yard painting gold feathers onto the body of the metal finch perched to drink from your bird bath. You seem content to leave this earth all that afternoon, sitting on the grass, golden paint on your small brush, on your fingers, and all around, gold paint dripping onto your rumpled pants. I mean, I, I mean that one still gets to me. Yeah. I'll tell you, man, old Jim Orr. This is uh, one of one of the this is one of the students I want to read to now. And this is the kind of thing I just God loved about those students. They were so open and, and they didn't they didn't know enough to hide things that uh, more cynical students knew. Mm -hmm. This is called Escopatara. And uh, that in Spanish, I had a friend translate it for me and he said, uh, Escopatara uh, means cheating on the shotgun. <laughs> 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 and, that, and it's for Wyatt, one of the students you'll see in here. And it has a little epigram from Joe Stalin. And, and Stalin says, ideas are powerful. We don't let the people have guns. Why should we let them have ideas? <laughs> Just a perfect. <laughs> you are not evil. I'm speaking directly to Wyatt, this student. You are not evil. And neither is Mikhail Timovievich Kalashnikov, the tank commander who invented the AK-47 after hospital time with other shell-shocked wounded soldiers. Their need for an automatic rifle to match those of the Germans. He created a rifle that wouldn't jam after drag through muck, snow, and dust, 600 rounds per minute and handmade right now on lathes in Pakistan's tribal regions. AK-47 flies on the flags of Hezbollah and Mozambique and has given the most death of any weapon in the history of the world. You, Wyatt, tell of 10,000 rounds fired through your AK without its jamming even once, of tracing it back through an Egyptian arms dealer to Afghanistan. You love that it will fire underwater. It's the best stress reducer you've ever had. This year, three of your classmates have named Hitler one of their heroes because he was a strong leader. You know better, but you don't know Cesar Lopez, poet of Colombia, who makes killer music on his Escopatara, an AK-47 transformed into a musical instrument. <laughs> He'd seen a soldier carrying his gun exactly the same way he carries his guitar. Quote, the weapons we use come straight from combatants. Some have the barrels marked with the names of their victims. So we mark them with the songs we play. The gun is in service to the guitar now, 
Caesar says, heading out into the mean streets of Bogota with his battalion of immediate artistic reaction. And what I forgot to say, and I thought it was in the poem, but isn't. Uh, Wyatt, I had them introduce themselves at the beginning of every class. I asked them to bring something to introduce themselves. Well, he brought his clip for his AK-47 to introduce himself. Wow. And I thought, you know, that, that wouldn't happen in Missoula at the University of Montana. <laughs> yeah, probably not. <laughs> no, wouldn't have, not, not then, but, but uh, anyway. So that's an example of the kind of thing I got from the students. Or, or they wouldn't say Hitler was one of their heroes. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that openness, you know, and and, and and you can get at it then. You can deal with it, you and talk to them about it. Well, you can certainly respond to it, yeah. yeah I mean, you if, betcha. No one, if no one's going to let you know about that, if that's what you think, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's hidden. Okay, I want to I want to do a bull rider poem. Um, uh, we, we got one bull rider there that had the bull step on his face, but uh. This, this was one of my last uh, uh, pieces in, in, uh, in Dylan. This is called Bull Rider. He arrives for class a day late, 22 years old, already a broken up seasoned cowpoke, lingers after class, pencils two pages about rodeo. Them bulls, something deep there but also frustration. Can't explain it. The Bronx barebacker saddle, they're no problem. Easy, but those Brahmas, that's different. We're equal. Or maybe I'm just crazy. My mom is the daughter of the last standing chief of the Blackfeet. I don't look Indian and I don't know much about it. All the Indians I know are drunk rodeo guys. A couple of years back, a bull stepped on the back of my head, base of the skull, put me in a 10 day coma. After that, this, this deeper stuff with the Brahmas got stronger, something spiritual. Maybe I'm just crazy. I was raised Roman Catholic my whole life, never believed it. Never called bullshit on it, neither. Look at these hands. They've been broken so many times. Every scar is a story. How do I tell that? He offers to set me up, if I'm ever crazy enough, to try them out. Those cagey Brahma bulls. <laughs> <laughs> But that kind of student, you know, I love it. I love those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and it's it's uh, because they come from because they come from real rural experience, you know. Oh God. And, and you know, and, and I and I don't know. I mean, uh, um, you know, there's there's plenty of that that still exists, and that was you're talking 20 years ago. Yeah. When you were working in Dillon, and I'm sure that it hasn't changed all that much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd go back there and teach now. Yeah, or Northern, or or any of the yeah. smaller colleges around the state where, where yeah. it's more locally, small town ranch kids and those kinds yeah. of people wind up uh, attending college. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. we're running out of time pretty fast, aren't we? Oh yeah, I think so. But uh, what do you Can want? I to read? A couple more. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, and 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 oh, oh yeah, and and I mean we we can go over and uh, we might have to edit something yeah. down, but I'll tell you in the process of listening to this broadcast, as you were reading a couple of different times, there was a couple of times when there was almost a breakup in the Zoom feed. So okay. Hopefully that uh, I mean it, it <laughs> didn't distract from the poem too badly. There was just a little hesitation in a couple of spots. But anyway, we'll read a couple more. And, and okay. then, like I say, we can do this again. I mean, for crying out loud, you just me and you alone, we could do this 40 hours easy. Yeah, maybe we should. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Posterity's sake, our family had listened to it. Maybe. Well, I, don't know. I don't know about that, if they maybe. were. <laughs> I want to read A 
China poem. And it's it's one of Ed Leahy's favorites of my poems. Whenever I say, well, "What should I read, Ed?" and you know, read uh, read "Looking for Marx's Chair." Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah and then and then I'll and then I'll do a short one that's just uh, Ed that I wrote for Ed lately. In fact, I just saw showed it to you uh, a week or two ago. Here's Marx's chair. Ed Ed just loved this poem, and I I do too. It's it's got one hell of a story behind it, but we won't get into that. She was something else. Um, oh, just a minute. I got to get up up here. All right, here we are. Looking for Marx's chair. And it's dedicated to an older Chinese woman that I uh, also had a crush on. And I, she was studying for a doctorate in England somewhere and said, I should come visit. So I jumped on a goddamn airplane and visited for nine days. <laughs> and uh, we just hung out all over Southern England. And, and this poem comes from that visit. And then I lost track of her. I have no idea what ever happened to her. Looking for a Marxist chair. We look for Marx's chair in the round library at the British Museum. The hollows his feet wore into the wooden floor. When I note how hard a life he had, but very happy, you say. He know his life, what for? You mend the thumbs of my gloves with blue English thread. Your scissors from the famous scissors shop. 30 years ago, Hanzhou. You remember the peasants from everywhere, China. One year, the government left them only enough food for three months. They'd cut wood in the mountains, carry it a day to the county seat, sell it for matches, cooking rice, oil, then walk home all night to work in their fields. Very hard is all you say and old time Chinese runners running so far into the mountains, they had to run in their sleep, would sometimes run into a spirit wall. If they said the right words, Buddhist prayers, jing, the wall would open. During the war, only Japanese were permitted to eat rice. If a Chinese were able to obtain rice, they ate it quickly and would vomit it up, too rich after nothing but horse fodder. When the Japanese found this vomit, they arrested the person suspected of owning it. That person was never seen again. Your parents gave you a bowl of rice for your 11th birthday and locked you in a cupboard so no one would see you eating it. During the occupation of Manchuria, the Japanese brought in settlers, totally destitute by the end of the war. These people had to sell everything. In the marketplace in Harbin, they begged the Chinese to buy their children. The Russian liberation was worse. One soldier stole so many wristwatches he wore them as solid metal sleeves from his wrists to his armpits. They dismantled everything, sent it back to Mother Russia. In the Cultural Revolution, your years in the countryside with two small children, your mother and a brother dying, a peasant woman found you washing clothes in the river, told you, be like us. Forget you ever went to the university. Here, take this blue cloth to carry the baby on your back. Be like us. Planting rice, small worms hooked into their legs in the cold water. They had to slap them to make them loosen their hold. Legs covered with blood at the end of each day. You left after four years of being like them. They walked alongside you for half a day, feeding you pieces of dried fruit and hope. 
They saw me and my children and gave what we needed. They are the only revolution. You speak of those you lost along the way, your favorite brother, home after 20 years of prison and special farms. He cares nothing for his own children, wants only young women now. I lost him, so many. I want to tell you what happened to my family, to close friends, so the world will know China this last 100 years. I am sad for my country now. You describe young women in Beijing hanging around the foreign embassies with $200 written on the palms of their hands. Sex, too, is a form of materialism, you say. The story of the teacher who helped you leave your husband. When you went to his office to thank him, he wanted sex. It was like swallow black fly, you exclaimed, grabbing at your throat. We come to a large willow on the riverbank. Do I know the meaning of the willow in old China? It is for saying goodbye to a friend because the feeling of the willow is like the feeling be between friends, soft. You hold a long willow. <clears throat> you hold a long willow <laughs> branch <clears throat> and wave. You hold a long willow branch and wave it at me. Goodbye, Roger. Goodbye. At the airport back in the States, I find a half smoked cigar in the snow set it gently between my teeth, taste someone else's lips stained with tobacco and spit on mine next to a blue Cadillac whose alarm I would like to set off. I'm as tough as a daffodil in the snow, but have a, the heart of a child, you said. I also have blue English thread in both thumbs of my gloves and the gesture of your hands grabbing at your throat. We never did find Marx's chair, but Jing, he know his life. What for? Thank you. That was tough. Uh, it does it to me every time when I get to that point in that poem, I'm sorry. No. What the hell? That's that's part of the gift. I, I mean, yeah. when a poem does that to you, you don't see it coming, and it happens. That's a, yeah. That's why it's there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know we're supposed to show our emotions too. You know, we think we're supposed to be cool, but well, I mean, it's, it, you you can't you can't you you can't purposely try to show emotion is not real. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can if you're a goddamn good actor, I guess, but yeah, yeah, yeah. that's just bullshit, you know. I mean, yeah, yeah. the only time it really matters is when it really matters, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, and Ed recognized uh, the power in that poem. It's a power of, you know, human suffering that, I mean, all poetry's got to somehow dance with at some point, I think. I mean, yeah, yeah. The, the idea yeah. of connecting with other people, that's really what's at the root of this whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. I want to do one more and yeah. then we'll do it for Ed because of his love of that poem and his love of me. Let me interrupt you with, with this short note before you read that poem. You know, when we started this whole damn thing and we were talking about Ed and you were talking about him being up on Three North and you going to see him as a sanctuary and all that, what I said to you at that point in time when I said, Read me that poem, that one you sent me. I meant this poem, the Our Faces poem. And you you went to the more recent one, the whale poem. So we have come full circle for me. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, here's a poem, Jan. I just found the scribbled notes for this last month and then worked them into this. It's Our, Vo Our Faces and it's Fred Leahy. 
just back from a half year in China, I find you in the psych ward of the local hospital, shaking, frightened, pale. An older woman just out from her first shock treatment asks, do those things give you a headache? Whew, mine sure hurts. You offer me an apple from the bowl by the nurse's station and ask me to give you some wisdom, anything to help you want to live again. You're a teacher. You've read all the great books. You've thought about life and death and meaning, and you're just back from the other side of the world. Give me words of wisdom. Help me. I don't know what to say. Your mad grief comes from a crevasse deeper than all my knowing. And part of me is still back in China. When they let me out of the state mental hospital, I went home to an empty house. My wife had left me and I sat in the kitchen two days, then took all the aspirin in the house. And I waited a long time too before I called the hospital. I was serious by God. I asked, how long did you wait? At least 15 minutes. That's not very long. It isn't? Seems like a long time to me. I thought you were going to say something like three or four hours. That would be a long time. Not very long, huh? And we both start to laugh at once and laugh and laugh until tears stream down our faces and the head nurse glaze, glares at us over her bowl of apples. <laughs> that's, that's, that's for old Eduardo. Not very long, huh? <laughs> I, I I like I like that poem. Uh, I just like the way it uh, it really does capture. Uh, uh, well, obviously your your relationship with Ed, uh, with the two of you, but but it definitely captures Ed. Yeah, yeah. you know, it, it's just it's so humorous in terms of the yeah. suffering uh, and and the real suffering. And the dramatized suffering, and the, you know, I mean, it's just like yeah, yeah, yeah. perfect. You know, it's yeah. not human, and yeah. that, that's what you know. I mean, if you can find, uh, I, I, I mean, I think that's one of the things we look for. Uh, one of the things I look for in poetry is is vulnerability. Yeah. When you when you discover that, you, you know you're not alone. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And this poem. I've been looking back through old boxes of shit, and and there was just a scribbled note on an old yellow pad. Right. I, God. Just enough, to, just enough to take you back there. Yeah. And trigger that poem. Yeah. 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 So. Well, man, we're uh, we're not too much over an hour, so uh, I I think uh, you know I, 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 I can do more. What's that? <laughs> I can do more. Well, I know we can do more, and uh, and but I'm gonna I'm gonna call this version of it, and uh, and then I'm gonna uh, you know probably be getting a hold of you at some point, and we will uh, we will do this again, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to do it again. Okay. Well, uh, uh, it's always a pleasure. You're such of a dear old friend and what <laughs> hell of a poet teacher. And uh, we'll see you again. All right, Mark. Great. Thanks so much for asking me to do this. And it's always good to spend time with you too, my friend. Yeah. Take care. Okay. You too. Yeah, lifetime feel